Hello. When I say nuclear weapons, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Bombs, like really big bombs. Yeah, big first bombs. Thing? Mushrooms. World War Two. Mass destruction. When it explodes, the okay, the, yeah, you know, the mushroom, the mu exactly. Blowing Much, shit up. Dude. Yeah, I'm mutually assured destruction. destruction. Yeah, dude. Yeah. How many nuclear weapons do you think the whole world has right now? The whole world. I hear it's a lot. A few hundred. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, uh. That's what I said seven. Oh, I thought you said seven D. No, I said seven. Oh, That's well, I, yeah, one three thousand. That makes sense. Alright, I'll go with seven. Uh, I don't have no idea. Like ten? I think more. <laughs> we have over fifteen thousand nuclear warheads. Oh, fifteen thousand. Wow. Why? That's scary. And who are we blowing up? Mars? Like, yeah. what are we doing? It's power, right? So much but power. I don't understand why you need it. You know, there's 15,000 on the planet, and you know, none of them are in use right now, but the fact that they're in human hands is alarming. I mean, mistakes can be made. We accidentally dropped two nuclear bombs on ourselves in North Carolina, and each of those bombs were 250 times the power of Hiroshima, and would have spread lethal doses of radiation to as far as New York City. How do you put How's that happen? Like, so shit lost it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's just oh, slipped through your gone. fingers. Like, that's unbelievable. <laughs> the fact like, that we accidentally dropped two, who's to say that that mistake won't happen again? How much do you think we spend every year on nuclear weapons? In America. Millions. Millions, maybe billions. <sighs> I just know it's gonna be too much. <laughs> <laughs> Way too much. Right now, every hour that passes, 2.2 .2 million dollars of taxpayers' money is going directly towards nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. 2.2 million per hour. That's pretty mind blowing. Every hour in the past. Yeah. Every hour. Yeah. I knew it was way too much. <laughs> On nuclear weapons specifically. How much, how much do you make hourly? Like 15, 15 bucks an hour? Care, we don't have to go there. <laughs> Valid. We don't have to go there. <laughs> what was it? What was it again? Every every what? Two point two million dollars every hour. Every hour. Oh my God, man. There are so many things that that money can go to. It's not just the money, but it's they they the would time. use the time and yeah, the energy and the to do other things. All that. They can use it to uh, do yeah, something yeah, exactly. that's more beneficial. To people you. people can't eat bombs and exactly. they can't eat money. You know. <laughs> It's not needed. We don't need to invest that much money in something that shouldn't even exist. I think it raises a question about aware, being aware. Like what the f***? I didn't know about that till just now. We all need to know that this affects every Everyone. single one of us. The planet. It's the fact that you possess such an ability to exterminate you, like so many lives. We all have to be concerned about it. Nowhere near as many people know enough about the subject. I think it's as simple as just telling people about it, telling people the numbers. We need to educate people yeah. on, you know, the situation that's happening firsthand. Yeah, it is going to affect us the most. Yeah. Uh, so, like, I guess our kids. <sighs> Some people don't know the first clue about nuclear war. We better start thinking in another way to go forward. Nuclear weapons are such an enormous weapon that they can't be used. The impact of a single explosion with temperatures hotter than the surface of the sun that has blast waves that vaporize all material within the immediate area of the explosion. The blast radiates out from there with winds higher than tornadoes and hurricanes so that everything is destroyed. Fire is created with anything that's flammable that in areas further out from the initial blast. And that's why Physicians for Social Responsibility worked with several scientists. We've known since the 80s and 70s that a full-scale nuclear war would cause climate cooling on a scale that we would have nuclear winter was the, was the terminology that was used. And how do you define full-scale? numbers, hundreds of mm -hmm. weapons being exchanged mm -hmm. between Russia and the United States, mm -hmm. which is, was the typical scenario back in the 
height of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Now we've done studies on a limited exchange. In other words, let's say India and Pakistan, mm -hmm. for example, exchanged 50 nuclear weapons. So they target cities, they target military sites, um, they go off simultaneously. And what happens is so much dirt and soot is, is thrown way up into the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. And those black particles block the sun. Mm -hmm. So you get immediate reduction in sun, you get decrease in precipitation, um, you get climate cooling. So even 100 nuclear weapons that go off are going to cool the planet by 1.3 degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. Now, that impacts agriculture. Mm -hmm. So you've devastated India and Pakistan. You've got radiation going into Nepal and Bangladesh and China. But worldwide, you have decrease in temperatures. Mm -hmm. And that's really what is being looked at is the humanitarian impacts of mm -hmm. nuclear weapons. And of course, we know of the 7 billion people on the planet, about a billion don't get enough to eat right now. Right. And so with those people, they're going to get less. Mm -hmm. So the studies that use now the very complex modeling for climate change show that in the United States, corn and soy crops are going to decrease over not just a single year, but up to 10 years, reduction in, in production of approximately 10%, possibly more, because when you get this change in climate pattern, you can get frosts, you can get snow, um, and we know this through real life experience. Well, my question is, how is it possible to have people actually think about this without turning off their attention. <laughs> well, there are people who are working on this, and they've been working on this for decades. And we're pleased that the total number of nuclear weapons have come down. We're pleased that we have treaties that say no more testing and explosions that can occur atmospherically or even underground. But you're right, we're living on borrowed time. So you asked, how do we live with that? Well, I think we have to do something about it. And mm -hmm. I'm excited that there is an international movement. It's not being felt quite so much yet in the United States, but there's an international movement that has held three conferences called Humanitarian Impacts of Nuclear War, trying to help educate governments and push the nuclear weapons countries into taking much faster action so that we don't r come into an, a situation where we're blowing up the entire Earth. And in December 2014, um, that conference was held in Austria. The amazing ambassador Alexander Kement was the initiator of that. And so there was a lot of really positive energy and mobilizing of people. But then we went to the NPT in 2015, and that just kind of disappeared. <laughs> so it really does seem there certainly is a base of people interested and motivated, but then there is this very large bureaucratic system, arguably of some who are not wanting the, who, who want the status quo to continue, one could say. And then there's a broad base of the public who just has no idea what's going on and is kind of freaked out about this stuff. So where do you think is the best place to focus on mobilizing the masses or on going to the politicians, or what would you say? Well, I think we need to do a number of things. Um, Physicians for Social Responsibility, we put our medical voice out there mm -hmm. so that we, we have legitimacy in talking about what are these impacts. Uh, so the first um, event and the, the uh, studies that came out moved the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Society to come out with a very strong statement saying all of our affiliates around the world should be educating people about the absolute need for prevention and abolition, in other words, getting rid of them all, mm -hmm. that that's the only solution to prevent this outrageous catastrophe that could happen. Australia, for example, um, their Red Cross has, has mobilized. They've educated people. They've told people about that. And I think as a result of this education and these three conferences, we now have 128 countries who, unfortunately, none of them have nuclear weapons, but they've signed this mm -hmm. humanitarian pledge mm -hmm. that was started by Alexander Kement, the Austrian uh, ambassador, 
And that's putting pressure on the nuclear weapons countries, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to keep pressure on them to get them to realize that this is real, to get them to realize that especially the United States need to, needs to take the high ground to say, you know, we don't need these. They don't deter a terrorist attack. They don't deter um, a conventional war. Um, and that now that we know that even a limited nuclear war will devastate the entire planet, how could we even possibly think about using them? So where do we put our pressure? Unfortunately, the American Red Cross hasn't come around. So call your local Red Cross and say, what are we going to do if we have a nuclear war? <laughs> um, but the Wor World Medical Association mm -hmm. and in this last June, the American Medical Association mm -hmm. said we do need to be educating people. Why do you think the American Red Cross has not come around, as you, as you put it? I think that um, the United States government is concerned about the way other countries mm -hmm. look at their posture mm -hmm. and they don't want to be seen as doing anything unilaterally. They want to take a step-by-step -step approach. Well, the as you U.S. government. The U.S. government, uh -huh. the State Department. And they've said that over and over and over again. We have to take a step-by-step -step approach. To nowhere, the bridge that leads to That's nowhere. That's the problem, <laughs> is that it's yeah. not working. For me, though, this this comes within the context of the current environment in which the nine nuclear weapon states are putting a lot of money into upgrading and, you know, making new their systems. And so there's a lot of defense budgets being spent on this. I believe that PSR, the Physicians for Social Responsibility, have been very active regarding the U.S. use of this slush fund. Can you talk about that in relation to the Tridents? Well, the concern is that the United States is slated to spend $1 trillion over the next 30 years to upgrade every single aspect of the nuclear weapons system and delivery systems. Mm -hmm. So the submarines, the land-based missiles, the bombers, mm -hmm. the ways of getting them there, better guidance systems, as if we're really going to use them and they aren't going to be targeted well enough? personally, and our organization, mm -hmm. feels that this basically is telling the other countries, China, um, Russia, that we are upgrading, that we are creating a new missile, um, well, the Russia's, long distance R Russia you know, is standoff upgrading missile. by itself right now, too. Russia's so upgrading, in, in, in huge UK ways. is upgrading. Yes. And it's a waste of money. Again, coming back to the point, these are weapons that cannot be used. All the war games show that once they're used, the escalation occurs. There's no stopping it. But it can come down to, you know, short-term business profit to a certain extent. And because a lot of companies, you know, this a major amount of money that you said, you know, some companies really want this and they have, in, you know, influence in Washington compared with, oh, well, you know, maybe this could be a very big problem later on. And so I think that we can understand the inherent stasis because it isn't only dealing with the humanitarian ideas, but rather, you know, cold, hard business. And so in that tricky situation, what do you see, because the earth needs a good doctor, <laughs> but what would you see as an effective way forward from here? Well, we need a bigger movement. Um, the, our international organization, the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, um, spurred and spawned an organization called um, ICANN, mm -hmm. um, the International Campaign uh, to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And so th that whole movement is what has helped create so many countries now clamoring for disarmament. So we need a movement. We need more people educated. We, in this country, need to get to the legislators. We need to create more champions, like uh, Representative Earl Blumenauer, um, to, to replace champions that have retired, such as um, um, Perry. Um, because that message isn't getting through to them, that these are not usable weapons. And the other thing that happens with politicians is, again, like with the U.S. government, 
they have to maintain a posture and so we have to move a significant number of them to realize that we have all the military might that we need, that we, that, that the current threats, climate change, terrorism, isn't going to be fought with nuclear weapons. That we really have to work on diplomacy and international cooperation to, to address real life threats. And that wasting a trillion dollars uh, isn't going to do it. The organizations that we work with have worked hard to try and educate and move around the budget, but I don't think that's changing hearts and minds. What do you mean by that? Well, I think that looking at one trillion dollars over mm -hmm. 30 years mm -hmm. sounds absolutely enormous. Mm -hmm. um, this year, the budget, I think, is 23 or 30 billion dollars for nuclear weapons. And that's only a small percentage of the whole military budget. And we're not even counting the slush fund that's going to pay for upgrading the tridents. And so, I mean, the money is crazy. Right. But at the same time, these politicians need money from the defense industry in order to be reelected. And so this is another vicious cycle, you know, connected to this whole thing. So let's go back. How do you think it's possible to empower, well, to engage? and then actually empower the people. I understand that PSR has some very good programs for youth, for example. Well, we just held a film contest, which was mm -hmm. great fun. Mm -hmm. We called it Nuke Busters, <laughs> and um, really trying to encourage young people to make films about this. Mm -hmm. And one of the winners was um, produced by um, a young man whose um, sister interned with us, oh. which is really wonderful. So she was full of zeal <laughs> about the issue. And he did a great um, film mm -hmm. that basically interviewed young people mm -hmm. who knew nothing about nuclear weapons. And mm -hmm. so it really comes to show that young people today don't know anything about mm -hmm. nuclear weapons and kind of in a humorous way mm -hmm. um, so that young people can engage and so mm -hmm. they're not feeling like, oh, I'm being lectured to or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But. Um, we think that it's really important for us to do more of the kind of film. Uh, we're creating a uh, TED educational curriculum mm -hmm. so that we can um, get into the classroom in colleges, whether it's communication classes or international policy, and really increase the awareness mm -hmm. um, so that our country is on the same path as these other 128 countries so that we can protect ourselves and disarm from nuclear weapons before they annihilate us. In looking at the medical consequences of nuclear war and, in fact, the humanitarian impact of this, th these are areas that have not been focused on before enough. How are you planning to use these in order to get your story across even more? Well, I think they were used back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, back then, there was um, documentation of the, um, when these explosions would go all off mm -hmm. in the um, above ground, mm -hmm. they were finding radiation in children's baby teeth mm -hmm. that could come from nothing but a bomb. Mm -hmm. They found that um, there was a decrease in the weight of live births occurring in the United States because of radioactive iodine that was being taken up through the grass, eaten by the cows, and put out into milk. So the, the impacts then were tangible. Mm -hmm. And that really spurred this entire movement to uh, pass the limited test ban treaty, to get the, the um, non-proliferation treaty signed and uh, in effect. Um, but as we said already, we're stalled. And mm -hmm. so this movement is looking at the humanitarian impacts, which is not just individual impacts or where the bomb goes off, mm -hmm. but again, that entire global impact, mm -hmm. um, to really move governments off of thinking that this weapon can ever be used. And also the issues of testing. We just had the alternate Nobel Peace Prize given you know, because of the whole testing issue, because it's not only if you use the weapon, it also is the production and everything around it. And so there is more information certainly going out to people in relation to this. What do you think is the next step? 
Well, we like I said, we need to build a movement. So we are going out and speaking to Rotary clubs. Mm -hmm. um, there is a organization within Rotary because mm -hmm. everybody knows Rotary is a huge international organization mm -hmm. that took on polio, and we've nearly eradicated polio. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a group within Rotary called the Rotarians Action Group for Peace mm -hmm. um, that is also educating and, and mobilizing folks to um, influence our mm -hmm. policymakers and further educate um, the population here in the United States and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons is working worldwide and we're taking that message and as you mentioned the don't bank on the bomb report mm -hmm. um, so that there is this huge influence of companies that support ever bigger better better in quotes bombs, bombs. and delivery <laughs> systems because they don't need to be any better they're already horrific right one thing though is that many of these groups that are fighting against the bombs um, Oftentimes they're fighting against each other, and sometimes they're fighting internally, and there tends to be um, something of not exactly a coherent communication matrix going on between the groups and among the groups. And so, in, and often they have different goals, different languages. Some want abolition, some want this, some want that, you know, zero versus I can. There are, there are issues there. What can be done to create more of a unification in this base in order to more effectively apply pressure to those making the decisions? Well, we do have coalition meetings. Uh, we do work with other groups. Um, again, like I said, the, the real unified push in the last maybe three or four years has been trying to get at it by cutting the budget. Um, I'm not sure that that's been very successful in this country. Um, so I think that we do need to um, increase our focus, work together. So our strategy is to in, in, engage the other organizations, engage the anti-war organizations, the Veterans for Peace, um, the Win Without War, um, and have them speaking the same language as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that we're visiting our legislators on a regular basis. That's where we are able to turn those people's minds in terms of saying, we can't have these weapons at all, um, <laughs> and developing new champions uh, for that strategy. Um, so Senator Whitehouse, Senator Merkley, um, took our report and wrote a cover letter and sent it out to all the congressional leaders. Um, but I'm not sure they all read it because it needs still to come from their constituents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so influencing this kind of policy, as I said, needs a little bit more of a movement. Back in the mm -hmm. Cold War, people were petrified. Duck and cover didn't cut it. <laughs> you know, they were petrified. And so mm -hmm. just like there was a mass movement now, more so for climate change, mm -hmm. um, we need to generate that enthusiasm again. And I'm really mm -hmm. hopeful that this show will help. <laughs> <laughs> Everything helps. But yeah. in terms in terms of the storyline to generate this enthusiasm, what I'm hearing is one, the horrific things that would happen, you know, the fireballs and everything, the medical issues of starvation and other implications there, um, the climate change issues that could happen, the financial implications could we not use that money on social services, for example? What are some of the other major storylines that are used to reach people? I think those are the major ones. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, we have so much need right now to address climate change, which is the other big issue that mm -hmm. Physicians for Social Responsibility works on. Um, that is was part of the cause of the Syrian revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to see more conflict. Mm -hmm. And unless we come to terms with what these international forces are going to do um, and, and realize that nuclear weapons aren't going to help at all, mm -hmm. that the waste of money on those when it's really needed, a billion dollars a year to help support third world countries leaping over fossil fuels. They can go right to solar, right to wind, right to efficiencies, mm -hmm. um, better grids, and so on. Um, 
that's a sp one billion a year. Mm -hmm. Three billion a year feeds everybody in the world. So the numbers we're talking about that can really produce change in adaptation and reduction in climate change is really what we should be looking at and focusing on and saying nuclear weapons doesn't solve any of these things. And, and you know, we have some wonderful leaders out there speaking about it. Do you think there'll be abolition in your lifetime? I think there will have to be. So on that very positive note, what I would like to ask you in closing is, I know that on the PSR site there are so many interesting and wonderful actions that people can take. Can you give some examples of things that people can do on your site? Certainly. I would love for them to watch some of the videos. Mm -hmm. I'd like them to share those videos with other people. We will be posting our new curriculum that can be offered to any high school university professor to be included in their curriculum mm -hmm. um, to share these things, to share the clips, and actually create their own. I'm for zero nuclear weapons. Let's put that on your Facebook page <laughs> and share that. Um, there's uh, petitions that can be signed mm -hmm. to President Obama, to the State Department, uh, letting them know that you care about this issue. And this issue has to be addressed before it terminates us. Um, so get involved. Okay. It's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that uplifting note, we thank you very, very much for joining us. And we thank you also for the amazing work that you and all, also everybody at PSR is doing. We thank you for joining us. And again, as Dr. Thomason said, get involved, visit the PSR website, and understand that this is an issue that everyone just simply must take personally. We thank you for joining us.